Welcome to another episode of the Regenerative Mindset with your hosts, Ry Seekins. And Miles Adams. Excellent. We're glad to be here again. Episode four. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the videos we have this week, Miles. Alrighty. Um, on my side of things, we got another, another video from Australia. Um, this one's about goats regenerating a forest, um, as well as protecting a town from fires. Um, and from you, we have a video called, a video about this old guy that um, helps regenerate some of the Texas countryside. Um, takes the worst piece of property you can find and makes it into just a totally beautiful ranch. Absolutely. Through all those things we've been talking about. Water mm-hmm. management, animal management, education. Biodiversity. Mm. 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 How about we some, go with some pretty concurrent themes? <laughs> and they're not so complicated, which is crazy. No. It's like it's every video. I'm just seeing the same stuff. Um, I'm like, all right, we're going to talk about it again. Let's go. <laughs> um, and every time I'm like, yes, yes, yes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Let, let's start off right. with the uh, with the Australian one. All righty. Um, this one is pretty cool. Um, it's made by Happen Films, and the title is How Goats Are Regenerating a Forest and Protecting This Town from Bushfire. We'll link it. Um, I really like this one because it's really focused on livestock, something we've kind of touched on but haven't really focused on, I don't really think. Um, and it shows just how important and helpful livestock can be in regenerating kind of degraded or overgrown land. Yes. Um, I think so basically general, general overview, um, is they're, they're in kind of more of a, a wooded foresty area of Australia. They're in Dalesford in Victoria, Australia. Um, so it's not, it's not as deserty. It's, a lot more wooded almost it kind of looks like the pacific northwest a little bit to me um so generally um these forests have just kind of gradually been overgrown with blackberries um and it's to the point where they have blackberry brambles that are almost two meters high um so kind of completely impassable um and the forest is almost completely dominated by blackberries. Um, that is and, like the ground level of the forest, right? We still got tall trees, but like... Yeah, yeah, we have, we have trees, but um, the blackberries start to grow up into the trees as well. Um, so aside from just kind of dominating the forest floor and not, not allowing other plants to grow, uh, these blackberries like pose a really big fire risk Um, because basically the brambles die um, and then new brambles grow back on top of that and it basically has just a firebox of tinder Um, and as well as the the blackberries growing into the trees that that, um, helps the fire go up into the trees and actually burn the leaves in the tops of the trees. Um, which is not very healthy at all. Um, yeah, so so basically the general, the problem is the blackberries are dominating the, the landscape. Um, but the first thing that, that the guy says in the video is, although they are the problem, blackberries are not the enemy. Um, they're, they're very helpful in um, building soil and habitat as well as stabilizing soil. Um, and as the brambles die, they become compost and slowly um, slowly uh, f- fuel the, the rest of the brambles. Um, yeah, but, but despite being not the enemy, there's definitely too many of them. They're smothering out the other plants and disabling biodiversity. Um, 
And so basically the traditional methods of dealing with these blackberries are like sprays and herbicides, um, heavy machinery and burn offs. Um, I feel like this, the herbicides and sprays are bad for a pretty obvious reason. They contaminate the soil and are, are toxic for the environment. Um, the heavy machinery, a lot of this forest is, is really um, difficult landscape with hills and trees and cliffs. So a lot of the machinery can't actually get in there. And when it does, it disturbs a lot of the, the good things that are actually going on despite the blackberries. Um, and the burnoffs. The burnoffs are interesting because I, I personally thought that burnoffs were pretty good and effective. Um, but instead of, instead of actually helping, they kill off the native plants as well as the blackberries, just leaving more room for the blackberries to grow back in the future. So they were talking, they did a burn off like a few years ago um, and the blackberries just grew back in higher force. Yeah, um, I thought it was really interesting what they said about it kind of restarts the weed cycle. Mm -hmm. Like right after the fire, all the, all the ash in the ground is a lot of fertilizer. It's condensed carbon and like available nitrogen from all the plants. Mm -hmm. um, and the blackberries. Yeah, they take Gross. advantage of that. Yeah, 100%. Um, and on top of killing back the, uh, the native plants, um, they, also, they also kill wildlife, um, such as they have ringtail possums and um, a bunch of birds in the trees because the blackberries are actually growing up in the branches as well. Um, so um, basically, they, they thought there has to be another way to do this, um, aside from these methods that I just talked about. And um, they started off just themselves, um, boarding down the blackberries, just basically putting big sheets of plywood on top of the brambles and just stomping them down, um, which kind of helps mitigate it, um, as well as just by hand with clippers um, cutting the stalks of the brambles. Um, but the problem with that is it stops the growth, but it doesn't really do anything with the actual brambles. Um, they just decompose and then new ones grow on top of it. Um, so their solution was to, to use goats. Um, and they said the goats are like incredibly effective, efficient, and on top of that, they're gentle. Um, the goats prefer to eat the spiky things. This, this particular breed of goat that they use um, can actually practically survive on blackberries alone. Um, but on top of that, they like, they like other um, kind of bramble bushes that kind of do the similar things that blackberries do. They don't specifically try to target the soft grasses that they actually want to bring back. Um, and so these goats are super easy to, um, to manage and, and use. So basically they, they fence in a little particular area of their forest. Um, fence it in with chicken wire. They used electric fencing um, later on. Um, and that fencing, they got to stomp down the pass for the fence. And that's the most work that they do mm. is actually putting up the fencing. Um, and then basically they just let, let the, release the goats inside the little area that they chose and um, just let them go to town. Um, he said... The first year, um, an acre might take a month for the goats to, to eat up. Um, but the cool thing is that the second year, that time decreases. They said it might take 10 days, third year, maybe a week. And it just can continually goes down the, the time that it takes for the goats to eat all this. Because right now the goats are eating all the past blackberries and stuff as well. Um, and so they can do it kind of every year, and there will be less and less. 
And so basically, as, as the blackberry growth decreases, other plant growth increases. Um, I feel like that kind of makes sense. Um, as the blackberries dominate less of the landscape, it has um, other plants have room to grow. And ideally, they, they want to transfer, transform these, these weedy forests into grassy woodlands, um, which is the natural, um, the natural ecology of the woodlands. And once they're grassy, they said um, wallabies and kangaroos actually use it as a habitat, and they themselves will maintain the forest. Um, but right now, the blackberry brambles are just too, too thick for anything to get through, even practically humans. Um, so these goats, um, they eat the blackberries, the growth decreases, and other plant growth increases. And along with, as, as the plant biodiversity increases, insect life increases mm -hmm. and as the insect life increases the small mammal life increases and once the small mammal increases you get more birds and more predatory mammals and so it's just kind of you can see how it's all connected and um how plant biodiversity <laughs> basically equals animal biodiversity um yeah and so it's this is mainly two guys doing this on on public land um but it's also partially private they um they go to the neighbors and ask them if they can put the goats on their land um and it had this one interview with a guy who's this this was his job was was like forest um not conservation but kind of management um and he personally uses spring, mostly life. heavy machinery um, in order to do that. And so they asked him if they could put goats on his land to try to help mitigate the blackberries. Um, and he was really skeptical because, because it's his job. He, he thinks, he thought that heavy machinery was the best way to get this done. Um, but he couldn't even do it on his property because the um, because it was too he had cliffs and it was too hard he couldn't get get the machinery in there so he had just kind of given up and let blackberries take over it was dry um, because the water that was coming but he said he was now. actually quite impressed um, with what the goats did um, and especially the speed at which they did it um, he actually learned that he had multiple cliffs on his property um, that he didn't know about because the blackberry brambles were so thick and so high that he thought it just kept going. Maybe it was like a little hill, um, but it's actually a, a physical cliff. Um, yeah, so basically these, these goats are able to, to navigate really rough terrain that you couldn't get other things into um and by by kind of talking to the neighbors and not just doing it on public land they're getting more people um they're spreading awareness and knowledge but also um neighbor neighbors are getting into it and they want to they want to help out um so they're kind of creating a community through this forge forest management um and trying to create a, a good ecosystem that works for everybody. Um, and finally, he ended with a, a pretty cool little memento. Um, and like he said, and this is a quote, I'm a second people's person on first people's country, um, but I have my own first peoples to draw on. We all come from first people somewhere in the world. Um, and I really like this. Um, I thought he was kind of trying to say, even though this isn't his ancestral land, um, his ancestors don't come from here. Um, that because of that, 
it's kind of easy to take it for granted um, and easy to think that, oh, I should get as much from this as I possibly can. Um, but we all have ancestors from somewhere in the world. So we need to we need to take care of where we are because one day we will be those ancestors ourselves. Um, so just because this isn't your land um, or your native land doesn't mean that it shouldn't be important to you. You should still be a steward of the land and take care of it. Um, because one day your children and your children's children might be living off of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for all that, Moss. Uh, yeah, that's a little general. I got a um, couple a couple points I maybe thought of. First one, like the first, uh, second people's person on first people's land. Is the, the idea that most of these practices that we talk about were, uh, were discovered and first put into action by first peoples all over the world who mm -hmm. understood their connection with the land in a much stronger way than we do now. Um, so, so much of this knowledge that we're discussing is, is handed down from them. Um, I think it's important that we acknowledge that, especially when we're trying to take care of the land like half as well as they did. Um, yeah, and it's kind of easy to, to, for, to not learn from the first peoples if they, they weren't your ancestors, you know? Yep. Um, but we... We can't, I don't think we should get caught up in, in all that. And we need to realize that this is where we are now. How can we best take care of it? Yep. Um, even if these weren't my ancestors' practices, what did the people that lived here before me do? Yep. Um, it reminds me of a, a story I heard about um, some of the English travelers to Australia, when they, like some of the English colonists, when they first... Um, they were like riding through Australia. I picture them on horseback. Um, one of them sent a letter back to England saying like, wow, these really are God's lands. They're so beautiful. Or just like everywhere is like a rolling park. The grasses are really nice and the trees are tall and there's a lot of room for like people and animals to walk through and it has like great soil and everything. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, then the English move in and they kill out, they exterminate the indigenous populations and the land changes. It's not that beautiful park. It's like very tough, brambly, and dry. And it's like, yeah, that that wasn't that wasn't That's God's gift in that way. You know, that was that was yeah. humans working with the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's not how it's supposed to be. Even though we think how it is 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 a natural kind of thing. It's, there's a lot of things, external factors that went in to to what it is now and we can't totally see that yeah absolutely uh now on the topic of livestock management livestock integration into regenerative practices i think it's sometimes easy to forget that when we're talking about like biodiversity we don't just mean like plant diversity we mean like animal diversity too and that in like the greatest ecosystems that ever existed you know the big beautiful forests they weren't just the plants the animals were super important like when it, when mm -hmm. the plants are just allowed to thrive, maybe that bramble takes all the way over. But when all the when these animals are able to come in and they help the forest go into balance, you know the balance of the forest requires those animals. So uh, we should be using those in our projects in our kick towards regeneration. Yeah, I think it's a it's a pretty big misconception that because the animals eat and graze the the plants that they're somehow bad for the land. Um, but in reality, that, that death is just all part of the balance of life. Um, and it's necessary in order for, for things to grow back. Absolutely. Um, reminds me of something a little closer to home. They talk, um, a lot of people, you know, in like, in like sustainability circles, talk about how bad cows are for the planet, all like the methane and greenhouse gases they produce. And um, cows living on feedlots and living in like unhealthy areas really are bad for the planet like that. Like they emit all those greenhouse gases and don't do anything helpful. Um, just, yeah. you know, provide demand for corn to be shipped to them farmed unhealthily. Right. Um, yeah. but cows integrated into the systems with regenerative agriculture and, and goats integrated to the systems like we're talking about here. 
and those guys are actually good for the world. So it's not really the animals that are bad for the world. It's the like, it's their practices. It, yeah, it's our unnatural handling of the animals that make it bad. Yep. Um, and kind of more on that, on the cow cow note, it's I've been like I've been told that um, that feedlots are actually better for the environment than grass-fed cows because grass-fed cows can like burp and fart like 20 i, I don't know the percentage but right uh, what about more methane than than the feedlots but the thing that they don't see is all the carbon being sequestered by the grass that they they graze and then that regrows um and in reality they're definitely carbon negative while the cows on the feedlots just continue to burp but um there's no grass being grown as they kind of move on because they're in the same the same pen for their entire lives yes it reminds me kind of like a general note about like deciding whether or not to do things i think it's easy to focus only on the negatives like say mm -hmm. like this this thing has more negatives than this thing but like this thing yeah. might have more negatives but also way more positives that ends up pushing it up uh-huh yeah that just makes it kind of bounces it out and makes it net positive versus less negative. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Also, kind of the way that you were describing this, uh, about once, this, once these brambles get cleared out and the forest becomes closer to that, uh, to that grassy woodlands and the wallabies and kangaroos can move in and they can start maintaining it. Um, I think it kind of furthers the story that we've been seeing in a lot of these, um, a lot of these videos is that like, Nature just needs a kickstart to get it back in a position where it can like start the yeah. upward spiral of life. And then every mm -hmm. year, like without even humans maintaining it, with humans being hands off, the, uh, the land yeah. gets healthier. And yeah, exactly. And even though goats may not be native to the Australian woodlands, um, they can be that kickstarter that, that allows the native animals to come back versus right. if you were to do this by hand, it would take an incredible amount of time um and kind of almost be impossible and the um, goats are so happy doing it you know yeah they're, <laughs> like... they're enjoying it they... <laughs> yeah um and they talked about that um you can tell when the goats are unhappy um and they're definitely not they're really loving what they're doing um and we're loving what they're doing also um, you also reminded me uh when you discuss how important it is for the community to be on board with this thing. Um, so like that area just outside the village is like public land. And, mm -hmm. uh, and in the context of public in this scenario, it's like owned by the government. So shared by the whole public of like Australia. Um, mm -hmm. And um, public lands are awesome. But I think one thing that like a public land being managed by such a big, big government can mean that the land right here, which most affects the people right next to it, um, is managed by a, a Bureau of Management office, often the equivalent of Washington, D.C. Excuse me yeah, for like, totally not knowing unconnected that. unconnected to the and, actual land. Yeah, and then the people feel less able to actually manage their own land because it's controlled by someplace mm -hmm. further away. Um, and they're, they're able to think, it's not my problem. Right. Like, the government will do that, yeah. Right. Um, so I think it's important that we like create and enable systems where people can uh, can work the land right next to them and like build those connections. Yeah, um, and yeah, um, and they don't have any any type of um, government funding or even like a go ahead. It's just it's fully on their own accord. They just kind of went out and did it. Yeah, which is really cool um, because. Another thing with the government is even if you don't think, oh, it's not my problem, the government will handle it, you might want to do something, but not be sure if it's allowed. Um, totally. Um, and they don't care. They're just going out and doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any other closing uh, thoughts for you? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, no, just... Each year they do it, it gets easier too, um, and they have to do less and less. Um, so it's it's just kind of kind of helping it get back into the cycle of 
of being sustainable you know beautiful beautiful um all right so the next video for this week we're talking about a uh one of the kentucky fried chicken farmer one of the infant <laughs> ceos what churches yeah i think churches. it's churches okay thank you yeah. thank you churches chicken one of the founders, yeah. one of the founders yes um uh, he grew up in the countryside, living near the Amish. And then he founded Church's Fried Chicken with his mate. And they, um, they built it up to 1,600 stores and then sold it. And then this guy bought 5,500 acres of uh, land in the Texas Hill Country. He said his mission was to find the worst land around and turn it into the best land around through these regenerative practices we've been talking about. So 50 years ago, he bought that land, 50, 52 years now. Uh, and this is just another, uh, another success story of all the things we've been talking about on this podcast before. He walks into this land, it's full of mostly rocks, dry cactuses. The, uh, you trying to walk through it, it's full of like brambles that are really, uh, really tough and dangerous to walk through for animals and people. Uh, cedar trees and you look through it now and you see trees and grasses and all kinds of diversity and you hear all kinds of birds and uh, oh, which is beautiful so how does he do this it starts with um, starts with the essential element of life water and uh, there's this really cool demo that he performs about rainwater harvesting it has a little machine that drips off water and um, underneath one of those Underneath one of those water drippers is a piece of dirt with all these uh, all these native grasses growing out of it. Another one is uh, a piece of dirt that hasn't been managed very well that has like a an invasive tree growing out of it. And then he drops the water on it. And uh, two experiments: one, like after a certain amount of water, how how long does either one take to flood? And um, the one with the invasive tree floods way faster. That is, like, the water s fails to seep in to the, into the dirt and just flows away and takes even some dirt with it. Whereas the one with native grasses, the water keeps soaking in for many times the time that the other dirt does. And um, it also stays wet longer. It doesn't dry out as quickly. So his mission was to spread that all across this land. And he did that by... Uh, by planting those native grass seeds um, throughout the land, throughout this degraded ranch. And now he saw, uh, and like his first sign of success was seeing the, uh, the streams run again, the streams and the, the springs. And uh, there's this beautiful shot of uh, spring water coming out through the rocks. The water that uh, came down from the rains, the same amount of water, he's not getting any more water again. Instead of it... Uh, quickly like flash flooding into the creek and being down downstream and even being someone else's problem being someone else's flood um it soaks into the ground and then comes out all year round in the form of that spring and all year round it feeds the trees with those deep tap roots and um feeds all kind of texas wildlife that's meant for that environment uh-huh and um yeah this is this is the texas hill country too so it's you know it's it's all uh, limestone and then underneath that, he said, um, when drilling a well, um, the drill, the driller guy said that his bit dropped like 40 feet. So he had a big, a big cavern in his, in his property. The only problem that was that it was empty. And right. so, so basically in order to get these streams going, um, he, he just has to put the gr native grasses so that the water can flow and, refill these aquifers in the groundwater yeah yeah thank you thank yeah. you and that's um this is watershed regeneration and um it's for everyone you know it's for wildlife it's for people uh, it combats freshwater scarcity combats food scarcity by the plants that are able to be grown off of this water it combats like climate climate disasters it provides like drought resilience and flood resilience that is if it doesn't rain for a long time the place is still all right the people there are still all right if it rains really hard it doesn't create floods knock down people's houses instead it soaks in the land and fills up that aquifer regenerating that water cycle is so powerful and that's what he what he demonstrated could be created there 
And then he also runs a like an educational center where people are able to come and see the land and be inspired about how uh, how powerful these uh, these ideas can be. These ideas regenerating the land, regenerating the water table. Because it's truly a beautiful property. The, some of these shots were amazing. Yeah. Bye. Yep. No, 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 thank you. <laughs> I agree. Um, yeah. Um, one more thing in the place. It, it sequesters a lot of carbon having those healthy grasses building that soil. This is a... Mm -hmm. To me, this is how we, how we combat climate change. We build... Um, we combat it not only in its causes, but also in its consequences. That is, um, we combat its cause by reducing the carbon that we have up there by sequestering it into the soil, and we reduce its consequences by building that drought resilience, by building that flood resilience. Mm. Yeah. And um, yeah. as far as this video's contributions to the regenerative mindset, um, I think it just shows again with such, such strong, such vigor, such powerful demonstration that these things can have huge impacts on the people, the land, the animals, and uh, that they can be a beacon of hope for people too through that outreach center. And uh, I've said it before, but this is such a powerful idea for me that we don't have to sit back and watch the world burn, watch the wells dry up, watch the forests become big fire risks, you know, with the like mm -hmm. fire turning orange like it was in California, with the sky turning orange like it was in California last year. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have to sit back and watch that happen. We can take care of the land uh, through these relatively simple practices, through water management, earthworks like swales and using the right plants like those native grasses. And uh, just like taking a moment to understand the world, be like, okay, we have this big, have this big uh, cavern down there that can be filled with water. Let's figure out a way that, to do that. Let's like, okay, native grasses seem to do this really well. Just like taking a moment to understand instead of just like trying to apply exactly what you want to have happen right now. Take zoom out, see how it works, understand it, uh, and don't just maximize it for us, maximize it for everyone. That is, like, not just maximize it for humans, but maximize it for all life. And really, we're not different from all life. You know, when we maximize for all life, we maximize for us, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this kind of, kind of reminded me um, of something that the guy in the, uh, the GOAT video said. I can't quite remember it perfectly, but he talked about being being a student of nature first before being an actor. Um, because if you're an actor without being a student, the only thing that you kind of truly understand is is yourself. Um, and then you kind of ignore or forget about all these other really important things that you don't know actually help you. Um, and so just taking the time to, to sit back and kind of watch and learn before acting is it's a big part of the regenerative mindset, I think. Um, as well as I liked, I liked this guy, um, the church's chicken guy. He just kind of talked about what does he want his legacy to be and what is his duty as a steward of the land. Um, do you want to make a bunch of money that might last your lifetime or do you want to do something much bigger um, that will last many lifetimes and affect many lives, not just you and your family? Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. I, that's, it's so... It's so strong within me to seeing that like when we take care of the land, that's such a such a healthier impact all around. Making mm -hmm. a lot of money like maybe makes your life better, but like and you've it can also not exactly like over a hundred thousand dollars a year. You've seen graphs where like happiness falls off once you're earning like over eighty k a year, and then like who's like what super rich kids are super cool? You know, <laughs> it's like yeah. it's like. Um, rich richness can be an ailment for a lot of people it's like no mm -hmm. i really think um there's kind of a crisis of meaning for a lot of people in our modern world when we're not as connected to the people around us we don't feel like what our actions matter that much so we kind of look around to like what 
what's a like easy source of meaning so we open up uh charles swab you open up your like robin hood stock trading you're like okay this number this is going to be everything i'm about we're just going to keep that going up to what mm-hmm. end there is no end it's just about the money and it doesn't matter who it takes from or who it hurts or even if it's doing a good thing and then people go there because they can't find anything else more meaningful in their life but it's like it's simple to see that that number go up when you don't think anything else really matters um yeah but I think we can inspire people to see that how, uh, how, our, how our presence in the natural world really matters and how that can be a, uh, how you can have a much more fulfilling source of meaning coming from there and a much more healthy source of meaning for you, your family, your place, your culture, all the animals around you, all the plants around you. So. And, and some people like, may think, how, how do I support my family? and do this at the same time. I think by doing it, you are supporting your family. You have something physical and real that you can hand down to your children and your land, um, as well as making their future better. Um, Because I feel like, I don't know how many generations we we have left of humanity if we don't do something. If we keep um, degrading our topsoil and keep heating up the earth, right? Uh huh. Like, yeah. How how much longer can we go on like that? It's, it's shit is already hitting the fan. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I live. Um, I live here in Texas, and as people might have heard, there's a big frost event. The Arctic storm came down and hit us here. And, uh, you know, temperatures, you know, we might freeze, but it's only for like one night. Here we were freezing for almost yeah. a week straight and um, tons of people's power went out due to like energy mismanagement and like we weren't prepared for, uh, like our energy systems weren't prepared for such cold. A lot of people's pipes burst. Um, but and seeing that, gouged, say that again. Out getting gouged by the, the um, energy companies. They have crazy high energy bills. Um, yeah sorry yep. keep going yep um yeah so in addition to this just being a, a major tragedy in the present and affecting a lot of people um it really sent me for a loop thinking about like the presence of climate disasters and and the like reliability of the system that we live in um first that like you know we've had droughts here in austin influenced by climate change and it's been like harder to grow crops around here but this was something that like a short-term disaster that threatened a lot of people's lives and caused like millions of dollars in damages to many different people. Um, Mm -hmm. And those those short-term disasters show stronger in in human consciousness. You know, they're easier to see, but it's like, are we going to keep having more of those faster and are they going to come more frequently and stronger? Yeah. I think they will. And um, I think they already have. Absolutely. Um, Just, if we look at hurricanes and, and all that stuff, it felt like a year ago that there was more hurricanes than I'd ever had. Um, yep. And nothing and yeah, felt like that was true, like, too. Uh, it's kind of like we're used to, to droughts in Texas. I mean, I lived there for, for 14 years. Um, it's kind of, that's almost a natural, a natural thing. It, It happens naturally. Although, yes, it's definitely climate change is influencing it and making it worse. Um, I think it still would happen. Texas is naturally a drier environment. So we have natural ways to combat it with our aquifers um, and with our groundwater. Um, But these giant ice storms are are not natural. Like I said, I live, live there for... 14 years and got probably half an inch of snow um and i was looking at photos and it looked like it colorado like that was we have no natural way to kind of fight that because it's so out of the blue absolutely so um i guess kind of back on this point of system reliability um, you know, if you asked me two years ago, if I think the, uh, the system would still be, by the system, I mean, like, our ability to go to the grocery store and get food and trade money for food, trade, you know, software work at some 
big company for food at the grocery store and then like always have power, always have water at these developed households, you know, how rely, how sure I was that that system would still be operational in 10 years, I would have said like 100%. Uh, but with like these disasters continuing and th there was some reporting and I'm not sure how like how believable it was, but that some people at, uh, at the, the Texas Energy Management Facility said they, uh, they, had, they turned off something that they believed if they didn't turn it off, uh, if they turned it off, like, they wait like 10 minutes later to turn it off, the, um, it could have blown something so big that the Texas grid would have been down for months. And then what are we talking about with the grid down for months? It's like, uh, I was a student at UT, it would kind of be doing any remote learning. Nobody could be working from home, especially with the pandemic. Like, We'd be thrown for a heck of a loop. Most people use cash for their credit cards. We couldn't be doing that. No power at the grocery stores to process credit cards. It's like, um, and that probably wouldn't be the total end of the system, but like, that would be a big hit. So now you ask me in 10 years, what's the reliability of the system? Um, you know, I'm not sure. 50%? Yeah. 70%? I mean, if one thing can have that big of an impact, I feel like it's only a matter of time before that one thing fails. Um, that's that's why we need backups and plan b's and um i think that's kind of what the the natural natural living kind of provides because you're not totally dependent on power electricity um or or money or you have the ability to do things yourself and think out of the box when what you have been doing isn't working anymore I absolutely agree. And I think that mirrors how like natural systems have built in resilience in them. Like, uh, like mm -hmm. a healthy forest, different species can, um, you know, if they don't get a lot of rainfall, different species fall out, but there's all these other species that can also take over those roles of like keeping the plant life down or like keeping things balanced, keeping, keeping the ground fertilized. It's like, there's so much redundancy in there. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah. I prefer, that's a good, good word, redundancy. I think that's something, at least through school, I've been told is, is not a good thing. Um, right. You don't want to be redundant. You want to be as efficient as possible. Um, but in reality, the redundant, redundancy is a big help. It's a big asset um, because it's something to fall back on. Um, yeah right so you make food and your neighbor you you grow food and your neighbor grows food and the grocery store grows food or like the grocery store system grows food and like your local co-op grows food and um That's you know the the big grocery store system could fail or like you and your neighbor could fail because you guys get a freeze down here that you didn't expect but the grocery store is like more diversified coming from other places you know but then there could also be like the grocery store goes down like cash doesn't work but then you still have food from your local co-op and your neighbors and stuff like that it's like um yeah that redundancy can be so powerful i totally agree uh-huh yeah oh yeah yeah it's kind of scary stuff and yeah, I think, I don't know, it's, I, I personally think it's all about balance. And I don't think, I don't think that everything we're doing right now is bad. Um, I think it's actually pretty cool electricity and, and I, I definitely really enjoy it. Absolutely. Um, and able to uh, listen to this podcast all over the world, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're able, I'm able to talk to you from Denver. Yes. Um, but we need we need balance we can't totally rely on that you know um and that's kind of more to the redundancy yeah yeah we need we need to be able to be resilient and we need to be able to to think out of outside of the box i agree i agree um well shall we uh shall we sign off i think yeah i think that's pretty good pretty good spot all right all right Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Um, thank you for listening. Um, we have a. Uh, hope you have a beautiful day today.